Listen to a conversation between a student and a receptionist at the registrar's office on the first day of the semester. Excuse me, I'm supposed to be having my physics class in the science building, but no one's in the classroom. Could you tell me where the class is? Physics 403? Has it been moved? Well, there's a room assignment sheet on the bulletin board outside this office. Yeah, I know, but my class isn't listed there. There must be some kind of mistake or something. Could you look it up, please? Hmm, okay. Let me check on the computer. It's physics, right? Wait, did you say physics 403? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but it says here that it was canceled. You should have gotten a letter from the registrar's office about this. What? I never got it. Are you sure? Because it says on the computer that the letter was sent out to students a week ago. Really? I should have gotten it by now. I wonder if I threw it away with all the junk mail by mistake. <laughs> well, it does happen. Uh, let me check something. What's your name? Woodhouse. Laura Woodhouse. Okay. Hmm. Woodhouse. Let me see. Ah, it says here we sent it to your apartment on uh, Center Street. Oh, that's my old apartment. I moved out of there a little while ago. Well, and I suppose you haven't changed your mailing address at the administration office? Well, that would explain it. Yeah, I guess that's it. But how can they cancel a class after offering it? If I'd known this was going to happen, I'd have taken it last semester. I know. It's really inconvenient for you. I understand that. But um, if we don't have enough students signed up for the course, the college can't offer it. You know, it's um, a practical issue. Like, we can't have an instructor when there are only a few students in the class. You see what I mean? I guess, but now I don't know what course I should take instead. Okay, let's see. Do you have any courses you were going to take next semester? If you do, you might want to take them now and sign up for Physics 403 next semester. Yeah, I guess I could do that. I just hope it won't be canceled again. Do you know how many people have to be enrolled in order to keep a class from being canceled? Well, it depends on the class, but for that class you have to have, uh, let's see, usually it'd be at least 10 people. But since it was canceled this semester, they might even do it with less. But you know what you should do? Give the physics department a call a couple of weeks before the semester starts. They'll be able to tell you if they're planning to go through with it. It's their decision, actually. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Thanks for the info. No problem. Sorry about the class. Oh, why don't you go change your mailing address now? It'll only take a minute. Oh, oh sure. I'll do that right away. Why does the woman come to the office? What happened to the letter the university sent to the woman? Why was the woman's physics class canceled? What does the man suggest the woman do before the beginning of next semester? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Excuse me, I'm supposed to be having my physics class in the science building, but no one's in the classroom. Could you tell me where the class is? Physics 403? Has it been moved? Well, there's a room assignment sheet on the bulletin board outside this office. What does the man imply when he says this? Well, there's a room assignment sheet on the bulletin board outside this office. Listen to part of a lecture in an environmental science class. Now, we've been talking about the loss of animal habitat from housing developments, um, growing cities. 
small habitat losses. But today I want to begin talking about what happens when habitat is reduced across a large area. There are, of course, animal species that require large areas of habitat, and um, some migrate over very long distances. So what's the impact of habitat loss on those animals, animals that need large areas of habitat? Well, I'll use the hummingbirds as an example. Now, you know a hummingbird is amazingly small, but even though it's really tiny, it migrates over very long distances, travels up and down the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, back and forth between where it breeds in the summer and the warmer climates where it spends the winter. So we would say that this whole area over which it migrates is its habitat because on this long distance journey it needs to come down to feed and sleep every so often, right? Well, the hummingbird beats its wings, get this, about 3,000 times per minute. So you think, wow, it must need a lot of energy, a lot of food, right? Well, it does. It drinks a lot of nectar from flowers and feeds on some insects, but it's energy efficient too. You can't say it isn't. I mean, as it flies all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, it uses up almost none of its body fat. But that doesn't mean it doesn't need to eat. So hummingbirds have to rely on plants in their natural habitat. And it goes without saying, but, well, the opposite's true as well. Plants depend on hummingbirds, too. There are some flowers that can only be pollinated by the hummingbird. And without it stopping to feed and spreading pollen from flower to flower, these plants would cease to exist. But the problem, well, as natural habitat along these migration routes is developed by humans for housing or agriculture or um, cleared for raising cattle, for instance, there's less food available for migrating hummingbirds. Their nesting sites are affected too, the same, by the same sorts of human activities. And all of these activities pose a real threat to the hummingbird population. So to help them survive, we need to preserve their habitats. And one of the concrete ways people have been doing this is by cleaning up polluted habitat areas and then replanting flowers, um, replanting native flowers that hummingbirds feed on. Promoting ecological tourism is another way to help save their habitat. As the number of visitors, ecotourists, who come to hummingbird habitats to watch the birds, the more the number of visitors grows, the more local businesses profit. So ecological tourism can bring financial rewards all the more reason to value these beautiful little creatures and their habitat, right? But to understand more about how to protect and support hummingbirds the best we can, we've got to learn more about their breeding, nesting sites, and um, migration routes, and also about the natural habitats we find there. That should help us determine how to prevent further decline in the population. A good research method, a good way to learn more, is by um, running a banding study. Banding the birds allows us to track them over their lifetime. It's a practice that's been used by researchers for years. In fact, most of what we know about hummingbirds comes from banding studies, where we um, capture a hummingbird and make sure all the information about it, like its weight and um, age and length, are all recorded and put into international an international information database. And then we place an extremely lightweight band around one of its legs. Well, what looks like a leg, although technically it's considered part of the bird's foot. Anyway, these bands are perfectly safe, and some hummingbirds have worn them for years with no evidence of any problems. The band is labeled with a tracking number. Oh, and there's a phone number on the band for people to call for free to report a banded bird they've found or recaptured. So when a banded bird is recaptured and reported, we learn about its migration route, its growth, and how long it's been alive, its lifespan. One recaptured bird had been banded almost 12 years earlier. She's one of the oldest hummingbirds on record. Another interesting thing we've learned is that some hummingbirds, um, they no longer use a certain route they travel by a different route to reach their destination. 
And findings like these have been of interest to biologists and environmental scientists in a number of countries who are trying to understand the complexities of how changes in a habitat affect the species in it, species like the hummingbirds. What does the professor mainly discuss? What does the professor imply might cause a decrease in the hummingbird population? What does the professor say people have done to help hummingbirds survive? What way of collecting information about migrating hummingbirds does the professor mention? What does the professor imply researchers have learned while studying hummingbird migration? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. So hummingbirds have to rely on plants in their natural habitat. And it goes without saying, but, well, the opposite is true as well. Plants depend on hummingbirds, too. What does the professor imply when she says this? And it goes without saying, Listen to part of a lecture in a film history class. Okay, we have been discussing film in the 1920s and 30s and uh, how back then film categories as we know them today had not yet been established. We said that uh, by today's standards, many of the films of the 20s and 30s would be considered hybrids. That is a, a mixture of styles that wouldn't exactly fit into any of today's categories. And in that context, today we're going to talk about uh, a filmmaker who began making very unique films in the late 1920s. He was French, and his name was Jean Panlevé. Jean Panlevé was born in 1902. He made his first film in 1928. Now, in a way, Panlevé's films conform to norms of the 20s and 30s. Uh, that is, uh, they don't fit very neatly into the categories we use to classify films today. That said, 
even by the standards of the 20s and 30s, Pan LaVey's films were a unique hybrid of styles. He had a special way of fusing, or, or some people might say confusing, science and fiction. His films begin with facts, but then they become more and more fictional. They gradually add more and more fictional elements. In fact, Pan LaVey was known for saying that science is fiction. Pan LaVey was a, a pioneer in underwater filmmaking, and a lot of his short films focus on the aquatic animal world. He liked to show small underwater creatures displaying what seemed like familiar human characteristics, what we think of as unique to humans. He might take a, a clip of a mollusk going up and down in the water and set it to music, you know, uh, to make it look as if the mollusk were dancing to the music, like a human being, that sort of thing. But then he'd suddenly change the image or narration to remind us how different the animals are, how unlike humans. He confused his audience in the way he portrayed the animals he filmed, mixing up our notions of the categories human and animal. The films make us a little uncomfortable at times because we're uncertain about what we're seeing. It gives his films an uncanny feature, the familiar made unfamiliar the normal made suspicious. He liked twists. He liked the unusual. In fact, one of his favorite sea animals was the seahorse, because with seahorses, it's the male that carries the eggs, and he thought that was great. His first and most celebrated underwater film is about the seahorse. Susan, you have a question? But underwater filmmaking wasn't that unusual, was it? I mean, weren't there other people making movies underwater? Well, actually, it was pretty rare at that time. I mean, we're talking the early 1930s here. But what about Jacques Cousteau? Wasn't he like an innovator, you know, with underwater photography, too? Ah, Jacques Cousteau. Well, Pan Levé and Cousteau did both film underwater, and they were both innovators, so you're right in that sense. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. First of all, Pan Levé was about 20 years ahead of Cousteau, um, and uh, Cousteau's adventures were high-tech with lots of fancy equipment, whereas Pan Levé kind of patched equipment together as he needed it. Uh, Cousteau usually filmed large animals, usually in the open sea, whereas Pan Levé generally filmed smaller animals, and, and he liked to film in shallow water. Um, what else? Well, the main difference was that Cousteau simply investigated and presented the facts. He, he didn't mix in fiction. He was a strict documentarist. He set the standard, really, for the nature documentary. Pan LaVey, on the other hand, as we said before, mixed in elements of fiction, and his films are much more artistic, incorporating music as an important element. John, you have a question? Well, maybe I shouldn't be asking this, uh, but if Pan LaVey's films are so special, uh, so good, why haven't we ever heard of them? I mean, everyone's heard of Jacques Cousteau. Well, that's a fair question. Um, the short answer is that Pan LaVey's style just never caught on with the general public. I mean, it, it probably goes back, at least in part, to what we mentioned earlier, that the people didn't know what to make of his films, that they were confused by them. Whereas Cousteau's documentaries were very straightforward. Uh, met people's expectations more than Pan LaVey's films did. But your true film history buffs know about him, and Pan LaVey's still highly respected in many circles. What is the main purpose of the lecture? Why 
why are panel of A's films typical of the films of the 1920s and 1930s? According to the professor, how did Panel of A's films confuse the audience? Why does the professor mention seahorses? Why does the professor compare the film styles of Jacques Cousteau and Jean Panlevé? What does the student imply when he says this? Well, maybe I shouldn't be asking this, uh, but if Panlevé's films are so special, but so good, why haven't we ever heard of them? I mean, everyone's heard of Jacques Cousteau. 